We've had so many requests to review this cooler that we're starting to question how many of you, yes, yes, I'm talking to you right now, are actually undercover paid marketing agents for Arctic, disguising yourselves in our comments to try and promote the review of their cooler. This is the Arctic Freezer 34 Esports Duo. It's a two fan cooler, hence Duo. Uh, it, it has color options, hence Esports. That's what that means at this point. Uh, and it's a single tower, simple cooler priced at $50 that competes most directly with the Scythe Vuma 2, which got high praise on our channel and with some of Noctua's offerings like the NHU-12S Redux, a very high quality cooler, if a bit expensive for its performance class, but that's Noctua's branding. So Arctic here is positioning itself in a competitive and exciting way. Let's get started with this review. Before that, this video is brought to you by Asus and the ROG Crosshair 8 series of X570 motherboards for AMD. Asus has both the Crosshair 8 Hero Dark and the Crosshair 8 Extreme available, offering high-end motherboards for high core count AMD systems. We've used the Crosshair series for years for everything from basic overclocking up to liquid nitrogen overclocking, and we found them easy to work with, particularly for their extremely well-organized BIOS menus. Learn more at the link in the description below. Does, does anyone feel called out in the comments? Because I'm uh, pretty sure that at least a few of you are marketing agents. We saw this with Scythe too. But sincerely, it's awesome to see the community get excited, especially when a lot of people are excited about specific products like coolers because it makes it easy for us to choose the next one to review. And uh, it shows that the brand has in some way deserved the coverage that it's going to get, whether it's positive or negative. So in this instance, Arctic is, it, it's been around a long time. The company does pretty big business for thermal paste sales. You likely know MX4 and MX5 now, but overall the company vibe we get is still that it, it behaves in a small engineering focused or boutique brand kind of way. And Arctic has been trying to shift focus towards higher quality uh, products and higher quality support, things like that. So the reason to point all of this out is that's a, a specific and strategic shift in marketing strategy and how it's approaching things, which means that Arctic is positioning itself, we think, to go more directly against Noctua rather than going directly against sort of budget-focused products like the Vetru V5, a fine cooler, but one which is clearly cheap and which is attached to a name that really has no marketing value whatsoever. Vetru could change its name tomorrow. No one would really care. It's just the cooler is cheap enough and it performs well, so that's why they buy it. Noctua, on the other hand, obviously has really good brand credibility. People respect it for its warranty support, its engineering focus. People respect Noctua because of the free mounting kits they give out. If you bought one of their $50, slightly kind of expensive coolers compared to competition five years ago, you'll probably be able to still get a mounting kit today for it, even for newer sockets that didn't exist five years ago. So that's where Noctua has built a lot of its brand. That's where Arctic's going. With this in mind, this cooler today is mostly going to be compared against the Scythe Fuma 2, which is around $60 and extremely competitive at the price. Really good, efficient performer. So the Fuma 2 mostly was known on our bench for being thermally efficient at a low noise level. That's why it was special. We'll also be comparing the Freezer 34 Duo against the Noctua NHU-12S Redux, also $50, and against the AMD Wraith Prism, which is included with some AMD CPUs, but if you buy it on eBay, it's somewhere in the range of $30 to $50. There are a few versions of this cooler, so just to make sure we're all on the same page for this, the Freezer 34 Esports Duo is simply a two-fan version of the Freezer 34 Esports, period, the one that exists already. The Freezer 34 Esports is itself a revision of the long-running Arctic Freezer 34. The primary changes between all of these is that the Freezer 34 and its Esports revision introduces an anodized aluminum heatsink and sleeker fan design, while the Freezer 34 Duo features the same slim tower design meant for wide motherboard and case compatibility and the same static pressure fan model as its predecessors, but it adds a fan. So it makes it suited for low to mid-tier CPUs and it's priced accordingly. You end up paying about $5 more for the duo version of this with two fans. We do have some one versus two fan tests using this cooler, just removing the back fan. We'll talk about that at the end. No chart for it. Just go through the data because it's simple. Our recent history with Arctic has been a little back and forth. So we were extremely impressed with their liquid freezer line. Those have done great. Uh, really competitive price to performance. They were like $90, $95 when they first launched for the 280s. Fiercely competitive, some of the best thermal performers. The little VRM fan on the pump block, it's a bit of a gimmick, but it's a gimmick that does something. So in that sense, it's a gimmick in, insofar as most of the VRMs that would be cooled by it don't really need its help, but 
than if you attach it to a really low-end motherboard. It would actually help. So uh, kind of interesting there. We like that product. We did not like the Freezer 50. It's a bigger version of this. Um, they sell a few versions of that as well. And uh, we just thought it was poorly designed, poorly executed. We had to Dremel out the shroud because it had a, a pointless point on it that restricted RAM compatibility. So we thought that was a poor execution. And now this is coming back to see if Arctic can redeem uh, its air cooling side. Enough of that, let's go through the mechanics, the installation procedure, flatness, pressure maps, and thermal performance. All right, on to talk about the mechanics of the cooler. The Freezer 34 Duo eSports features a similar compact single tower design as many mid-tier coolers like the Hyper 212 and the Noctua NHU 12S Redux. This makes it compatible with most cases and RAM. It's 124 millimeters wide, it's 103 millimeters long, and it's 157 millimeters tall with little to no overlap on the RAM for most motherboard configurations that have a standard rectangular design. Luckily, that means we didn't have to dremel it, unlike the Arctic Freezer 50 that we reviewed previously. I've been in here for three hours and I haven't even turned the computer on yet. The fans are unfortunately unable to be adjusted upwards in the event you had to accommodate something beneath them just because of the way the fans are secured to the coolers. But this shouldn't be an issue for the vast majority of users and motherboards that we can think of. The cooler itself is sturdy. It doesn't feel cheap or like it might fall apart under tight mounting pressure. There's a slight lack of paint on the heat pipes at the bottom of the cooler, but this doesn't affect performance. It can't be seen once the cooler is actually installed and it's unsurprising in what is still a mid-tier cooler. As for why I even mention that at all, it really just helps us illustrate another point, which is that quality is good enough that we had to nitpick to an extreme degree to find something like this. There's one larger QC issue that we'll talk about a bit later, but for the rest of it, for aesthetics especially, this thing is overall fine. The Freezer 34 Duo features two of Arctic's 120mm Bionics P fans, which are designed for high static pressure and low noise. We'll see how they perform acoustically in a second. The fans range from 200 to 2100 RPM, which is both higher and lower on the range than the fans on most CPU coolers. The rear fan, but not the front, also comes with foam pads to reduce vibrations, and in that regard, we found it to be effective. Time to get into the installation. The mounting hardware of the eSports Freezer Duo is simple and solid overall. For AMD motherboards, the first step is to remove the two fans by releasing the captive wire mounts, which are both easy to work with and secure for holding the fans to the cooler. Arctic standoffs then need to be installed onto the AM4 backplate, although there are three different sets of standoffs, so obviously make sure you're using the right ones with the right thread count. From there, you'll apply the included MX4 thermal paste or your own, which is something we like to see over some of the cheaper pre-applied paste solutions that we see on other low-end coolers. Although for our testing, we use a different standardized paste for all of them. Then the Freezer 34 Duo is placed onto the CPU and the four knurled thumb nuts are tightened to secure it to the standoffs. Hand tightening is good enough if you put some elbow grease into it, but a screwdriver can help, just don't overdo it. At this point, the fans can be reinstalled on the cooler with the captive wire mount and the cold plate of the uh, eSports Duo lines up with everything. But it doesn't cover the entirety of the CPU's IHS, especially Alder Lake or AM4 CPUs. As we're going to see in a second, it doesn't invalidate it for use, it just means that you have less surface area contact, so it will affect the efficacy of the cooler, but not in a way that really makes it unusable, and you'll see that. The documentation and packaging for the Arctic Freezer 34 eSports Duo is adequate, but nothing special. Our cooler arrived with all of the hardware listed in its manual. It doesn't include a screwdriver, but our staff is split on that, and we'd actually be curious what your thoughts are here. Some of us, like me, prefer no included tools, since we get a million of them every time we buy anything. We have a drawer full of Allen keys, many of which are do dodecaplicates, if that's a word, and we really don't need any more, so there's that angle of it. At the same time, though, we have some staff members who would like the included screwdriver just because it ensures you have the right tool for the job. Either one seems like a fine preference, really. It reduces waste to not include them with every single product ever made, but also not everyone has all these tools from previous purchases. Time to look at how all this stuff actually affects the cooler and its ability to mount flush with the IHS. We'll take a look at pressure across the IHS first. The really interesting test will be the flatness test that's coming up next. But this one allows us to see how well the mounting hardware works. It doesn't tell us about the flatness of the cooler. 
We test using chemically reactive materials and a special National Institute of Science and Technology traceable scanner whose purchase was made possible through all of our supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Thank you very much for allowing us to buy these types of things. And from those who buy merch like the toolkits, the mouse mats, the shirts, and other items on our GN store over at store.gamersnexus.net. Again, thank you for making what we do possible. The scanner evaluates the mounting hardware more than the flatness. So the scanner shows an impressively even distribution of pressure on the IHS for the 34 Esports Duo. It applies pressure consistently across the entire IHS, and this is one of the best scans we've ever seen on a cooler. There's a slight reduction in pressure in the bottom left corner when tested with the 3950X. And again, these are tested with them off. The 3800X IHS, we observed, had slightly more pressure around the edges and along the exposed heat pipes with the 3800X, a feature that's normally much more pronounced with coolers that have exposed heat pipes like this cooler. As a reminder, all this doesn't necessarily mean it'll perform better than coolers with uneven pressure, but it does mean that Arctic's mounting system for the Freezer 34 is consistent and that they aren't leaving any, or at least not much, performance on the table with the design of the mounting and the cold plate. As always, RAM is oriented downwards in this image. This chart's going to be a little crazy. The next test is our surface flatness test, done with an extremely precise needle and from a known zero point in microns delta from that zero point. This chart shows that the Freezer 34 already has some of the deepest pits we've seen. Oh wait, actually, wrong chart. There we go. The Freezer 34 had okay average surface flatness with relatively consistent results in the eight to 13 micron range, but it had a couple of massive spikes at 200 microns in depth. That's terrible. And it's deep enough that it's questionable whether paste would even fill that void. This is clearly the worst outlier result we've seen, but the average remains better than the wide variance seen in the A500, for example. And ultimately, it's the average that matters the most. A couple of craters won't crater the performance. A lot of them will, but then you would see a much wider uh, bar for the median. If we take a look at the cold plate itself, it becomes clear why this happens. At some point in manufacturing, the grinder took a big chunk out of one edge of the cold plate. This is an area that actually contacts the IHS. So it would see use if it weren't ground down 200 extra microns, but fortunately the pressure map showed that it didn't affect things too much. This seems like more of a quality control issue. We don't think this would be present on all the units because it doesn't look uniform. It looks like basically an accident. But Arctic should still maybe look into or tighten its QC process for this plate. Time to get into the performance. We'll start off with a 68 watt heat load with AMD's R5 CPUs, which is where this tier of cooler is really geared towards. This test is representative of something like an R5 or a non-K i5 or i3 CPU heat load. We'll cover a higher heat load in the next section with an R7. In this test, the noise levels of the coolers are normalized to provide an even playing field and prevent any absurdly loud high RPM fans from brute forcing their way to the top of our charts. But we'll look at peak cooling performance in a moment. All the coolers use their included fans. There's no change to any of the hardware other than to set 35 dBA for the system noise level. And here's that chart. At 35 dBA, the Arctic Freezer 34 Duo comes in ahead of every other cooler in our limited low TDP data set. Load temperature is 38 degrees over ambient, making it more than capable of handling a heat load of 68 watts. It comes with an error of the Noctua NHU-12S Redux as well, which is about a $50 cooler. The comparison to the Vetri V5 is also favorable, and that's a $25 to $35 cooler. The Freezer 34 is 10 degrees cooler than the AMD Wraith Prism and 26 degrees cooler than the passive Noctua NHP1, which is predictably the hottest since it's passive. Next up is our 100% fan speed test with a 68 watt heat load. This test is designed to show the absolute maximum of cooling performance of each cooler, so coolers with more powerful or plentiful fans will generally perform better at the expense of being louder. In this test, the Freezer 34 Duo is practically tied for first place with the Scythe Fuma 2 measuring at 37 degrees Celsius over ambient. The Freezer 34 Duo is within our margin of error of the Noctua NHU-12S Redux once again. So really here what we're looking at is, for the most part, whichever is cheaper is fine. Although there is value to buying each one in different ways, which is all covered in the reviews. The noise levels land on the Freezer at 42 dBA, making it far less efficient than the Fuma 2. Noctua is similar to the Freezer for noise, so this chart really just makes the Fuma 2 look good for its noise performance results. It's much larger, it is a little more expensive, so you're paying for it in two ways, but it's got great efficiency. For the rest, the Freezer is cooler than the AMD Wraith Prism by 6 degrees, 
and it's also quieter. Moving on to our noise normalized 123 watt heat load with an R7. The Freezer 34 Duo is up against a higher challenge here. This test is representative of most post Tau Intel K SKUs and AMD R7 CPUs, which is a bit above the intended use case for the Freezer 34 Duo. But given its prior performance, Let's see how it does. Here's the chart. At 35 dBA, the Freezer 34 Duo comes in at 56 degrees over ambient. That would put it right in the middle of our data set. That's also in about the 70s when factoring in the local ambient. This is ahead of the Nocto NHU-12S Redux by 4 degrees, the Scythe Ninja 5 by 6 degrees, and the Vetru V5 by 6 degrees as well. Embarrassingly for Corsair, it's also about equal to the A500, which is a cooler that launched at $100. At least before our review launched, it, it came down in price a little bit. Finally, the Scythe Fuma 2 and the Freezer 34 Duo are within our margin of error of each other, but note that the Fuma 2 is barely too quiet to hit our noise target, so there's a little more room in there. This demonstrates the advantage of the Freezer 34 Duo's dual fan push-pull design with it widening the gap between it and the Noctua and HU-12S by 5 degrees compared to our 65Y heat load. Last bit of data too before we get to the conclusion. So we did a single versus two fan test on the same cooler and it's not worth putting in a chart, but the difference was one to two degrees maximally on the 68 watt heat load. So not a big difference going with two fans versus one. At higher heat loads, it starts to matter a little more, but uh, for what we were testing today, we didn't see a huge change in performance. What this will mostly allow you to do is run the fans a little bit slower. So in terms of noise efficiency with two fans at a slower speed, you're gonna get the same performance as one fan at a slightly higher speed, but it's, it's pretty much a negligible difference for most people. So that's it then for this one. Arctic has overall impressed us for the Freezer 34. It's a good thermal performer. Acoustically, it's fine. It's not the most impressive we've seen. We would boil it down this way. The simplest way to, to recap this is as follows. The Scythe Fuma 2 remains probably the most efficient in terms of noise, uh, as in a hard noise level for the thermal performance we measured out of all the coolers we've looked at so far in sort of this price territory. A high-end liquid cooler would do better. So a, a liquid freezer 280 would do better than the Scythe Fuma 2 in terms of the temperature you get at a given noise level. You could bring down the noise level significantly below the Scythe Fuma 2 even with the liquid freezer 280 and still get the same temperature at the end of it. So that's great, but that's also what you would expect for a cooler that's almost two times as expensive and uses liquid instead of only using air and the relatively menial amount of liquid in the heat pipes themselves. So the Fuma 2 remains sort of a king or a winner in its category of noise efficiency for the thermals. The Freezer 34 might not win that category, but it was at the top of the charts or very near the top of the charts in basically every heat load we tested. It does great with an R5 or i5 class CPU. Once you get them to the 120 to maybe 130 watt category with something like an AMD R7 stock or an Intel i7 stock or an Intel CPU post tau boosting duration. It remains a good performer. It is completely suitable for that class of CPU. We wouldn't recommend this once you're getting up into the 200 watt range for heat load. So something like an overclocked R9 or an Intel 12900K, you should put something else on it instead. But uh, overall, we were impressed with the performance. It is a worthy competitor in the 40 to $60 price class. If you want something that is almost as good thermally, but isn't quite as good, but cheaper. The Vetru V5 remains a worthy alternative to something like this. A little bit less brand credibility or recognition, but they're building on it and um, it, it's fine thermally. Now, one thing we like here is that Noctua and Arctic are both doing something with newer mounting kits. So if you buy this, if it's been on the shelf a while, it's possible it doesn't have an LGA 1700 kit in it, they will ship you one as we understand it for free. So that's great. That's what Noctua does as well. It's basically, hey, as a thank you for buying our product, which is really just metal and screws, so it can live forever, we'll ship you the mounting kit and you can install it on whatever new sockets come out up to some point. Now, obviously there's no guarantee Noctua and Arctic do this forever. Probably at some point they'll stop supporting certain coolers, but for now it's a policy that's in place. We can't review the future, we can review today. And so far the customer service for both Arctic and Noctua look to be about head to head and even from our experiences with them. All that said, we have one main complaint with this, which is that the cold plate contact is not tremendous. So 
Uh, when you put this onto an IHS from an AMD Ryzen CPU or a new Intel CPU, especially Alder Lake, you're not going to get full coverage. That's not always a big deal. It gets to be a big deal with something like Threadripper, which this is obviously not suited for, uh, or Alder Lake at the 12900K level because you're producing enough heat and power there where it really you want to leverage the whole IHS. It will cool more efficiently. You'll have more surface area to get the heat from the IHS, so it's silicon to... Uh, normally a solder, sometimes a paste, into normally like a gold mixture into the nickel-plated copper cold plate or IHS, and then through Tim and then into the cooler. You want as much contact surface area there as possible. This doesn't really give you that. It's fine, as we said, for R5s, I5s, things like that, R7s, but uh, higher heat loads, it's not going to be that efficient. Our next complaint is the one we mentioned in the uh, flatness testing, where the grinder, whoever was working on this cooler on the way out the line, uh, they took a chunk out of the contact area right where it would actually contact the IHS if it weren't 200 microns deep by accident. So that could be improved. But overall, we are fine with recommending this cooler in the price category. We would say strongly consider the Scythe Fuma 2 as an alternative. The NHE12S Redux is very expensive for what it provides. If you really only care about sort of the Support and engineering aspect of a brand, and you don't think too much about the product's performance, okay, but this and the Scythe Fuma 2 would be the two main ones we look at at that price category. And uh, it is a, a huge upgrade from the AMD stock coolers, which we tested because, I mean, the, the noise efficiency is just far better. So you'll be able to bring down your noise levels relative to the temperature result you're getting with this versus a stock cooler. So those are the ones to look at. Um, let us know what you want us to look at next. The Vetro V5, just to throw that in here, is a really good alternative if you have a stricter budget. So consider that too, but these uh, give you something at the higher end. Let us know what coolers you want us to look at next. We are working through a lot of them now. Uh, we're still interested in looking at air coolers at the moment. A lot of requests for Be Quiet, if that remains the case. Post the one you want us to look at because there's a lot of Be Quiet coolers. We'll work on that. And thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly, or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. We'll see you all next time.